Okay. Any clarification, questions, doubts? No. Okay. So in that case, uh, let us talk about evaluating free energies. Um, and you have already seen. Uh, Ferdi has done the basic statmec, at least some introduction to free energies and how they are related to um, the statistical quantities. Specifically, with respect to partition function, how it is related is something that you have seen. Um, it becomes important to evaluate free energies in many cases, and uh, so atomistic simulations are used extensively to do free energy evaluation. What does free energy involve? Free energy involves, right, something like this. U and H, I am not making a distinction. Uh, because condensed systems U plus PV is approximately the same as H, because PV is uh, negligible, right. And if you are doing any simulation, atomistic simulation, Monte Carlo or molecular dynamics, you are having this quantity, right, you have the potentials. So, you have the potential energy given the configuration you can calculate. If you are using Monte Carlo, you are giving the bond energies, right. We gave E A A, E B B, A B, etcetera. So, you can count the total number of bonds of different types, add them all up, you will have this quantity. What is harder to get is the entropy and as you have learnt, there are two, at least two important entropy contributions that one can get. One is the configurational, other one is the vibrational. The typical approximation that is made to get entropy, which was also derived, uh, which went uh, something like uh, S is uh, minus uh, uh, K B uh, N um, and then you had uh, uh, X A ln X A plus x b ln x b, right, something like this. Now, this is derived by assuming that it is like ideal mixing, okay. But you know that that will not be the case if, for example, if a, a, b, b, a, b, three types of bonds are there, unless you do not distinguish between these three type of bonds, this approximation is not a good approximation. For example, if A B bonds are preferred, then in the lattice you will find that more of A B bonds forming, which means assuming that these are randomly distributed. Remember this came from assuming that these are randomly distributed and hence we calculated the number of states omega and then we took ln and multiplied by kb and so on. So, that assumption is not valid. That is why if you look at uh, textbooks, um, Gaskell or Porter and Easterling and books, textbooks like that, they say that uh, if you look at the difference between different bonds, specifically they define a quantity uh, which is uh, I think called omega. Uh, they should not confuse it with the other omega which is for the number of states uh, in the k b ln omega um, which was defined as E a b minus E a a plus E b b by 2. What does this mean? You take a a bond, b b bond, break them, make a b bond, okay. So, you have broken these bonds and so the average energy to make a A B bond, how is it compared to A A B B bond? That difference, if it is positive or negative, that is what you saw ordering and phase separation. If this has higher energy, then A A B B bonds are preferred, so the system will phase separate. If it has lower energy, then the system will order. I showed you the Monte Carlo simulation where we had this checkerboard kind of. Uh, yellow, black, yellow, black and so on. That is because A B is preferred. 
So A will be surrounding B, B will be surrounding A and so on. So if either of that happens, then this approximation is not valid. So textbooks say that only in the case omega is very close to 0, uh, then this is a good approximation for entropy, otherwise it is not. So what is problematic or what is it for which you have to work harder is to get the entropy. Okay. So if you get the entropy, you can get free energy and uh, if you get either entropy or free energy, everything that is there to know about the system is known to you thermodynamically anyway. So that is the main reason why we are interested in the free energies and uh, the cost in getting the free energies is mostly evaluation of um, entropy. And because it is evaluation of entropy, you can also see that if you do only molecular dynamic simulations, the entropy that you will get will be only the vibrational entropy because molecular dynamics does not go to time scales where diffusion is possible. If diffusion is not possible, configuration is not going to change. If configuration is not allowed to be explored, you cannot get information about the configuration entropy. Okay. So typically MD simulations will give you the vibrational entropy contributions. You have to do Monte Carlo if you want to get the configurational entropy contributions. Of course, you can do them and get both these entropies from which you can evaluate the free energy. Okay. So you can think of it as uh, entropy evaluation or free energy evaluation and you will see that uh, in these cases, there is an integration that needs to be performed to obtain the quantity of interest, entropy or um, free energy. And, uh, and that is where you, you should also think about uh, uh, Monte Carlo is also an algorithm to do integration, right? Do you know about this idea that Monte Carlo, how to do? Ha, huh. but uh, I mean, what is the idea behind the Monte Carlo integration, do you know? Uh, like uh, to calculate pi or something, people will use Monte Carlo. Uh, Right. And from that by taking the area and if you are assigned mass, so the the property and mistaken a bit, but taking that we find the that Yeah. Suppose I take a square of known size, right? And then I have a circle, there could be two circles, one bigger circle and one smaller circle. It need not be a circle, I mean it could be a some random shape. For pi evaluation, it is the circle, but you can also evaluate the area of some random region that is. Now what do you do? You throw dots at it or you throw random points, right? Can you see that the number of dots that will lie inside the region to the number of dots that will lie outside the region is proportional to the area of the region, right? Suppose if the full region then 100 percent of them will fall and the, suppose the area is 50 percent, 50 percent of them will fall provided you are doing it randomly, right? You are not methodically throwing, then you will not get it. But if you throw randomly, you expect that if it is 50 percent area coverage, 50 percent of the times it will fall there, right? So you can throw random points, all you need to know is whether the point fell inside or outside and after you have thrown some 100, 200 points, then you find out how many of them fell inside, how many of them fell outside, you take the ratio. This area is known. So you multiply that ratio by this area, you will get the area of the given region, right? So this is the idea of doing a Monte Carlo simulation to evaluate an integral. Of course, in this case it looks trivial, even that is not trivial if you have a very complex shape uh, integrating the area is uh, involved. But it becomes much more important if when you have to do higher dimensional integrations. Okay. There is also a problem in the sense that higher dimensional integrations, many, many points might lie, you know, the area is really the, the, the volume or whatever hyper volume is so high that many of these moves might be wasted moves. They are not going to get you something useful for you. 
Okay. So, there is a way to think about metropolis which is to uh, even sampling, you bias the sampling in such a way that the most probable ones are sampled more than the least probable. Okay. So, we will not go there, but you can see that techniques like Monte Carlo or statistical techniques are useful to evaluate integrals and you can think of these integrals also as some higher dimensional integrals that we evaluate using the uh, stochastic or statistical techniques. Now, specifically I am going to talk about uh, molecular dynamic simulations to get free energies in certain systems. As an example, I will show one of the integrations that we ourselves have evaluated, which also brings in other considerations, which is normally not written down or people think that it is uh, um, sort of uh, commonsensical, uh, but first time when you are doing it is useful if somebody tells you these things instead of uh, you are spending lots of time. Now, the, there are two methods to evaluate free energies by atomistic simulations. One is the equilibrium method and that is the classical thermodynamic integration approach, but more and more non-equilibrium approaches are being used. They were known even earlier, uh, but nowadays I mean most of the papers you will find that people are using only the non-equilibrium methods. Specifically, frankel ladd and reversible scaling are methods that are used in the uh, s uh, solid systems for evaluating free energies. Uh, the same formulation works, you can do it for MC except that the uh, entropy that you will evaluate will become configurational and not vibrational. Okay. Um, and uh, there are ideas, some of these are very nice ideas, uh, some of them are very clever ideas and uh, they all have lots of uses and uh, Ferdi himself will talk about one of the approaches that he has used extensively uh, at some point. Okay. So, this is an introductory lecture at uh, some point he will also talk about uh, uh, the method that he used. Now, free energies are important, I think everybody agrees here or most of the people here know why they are important. Um, one of the reasons why we were interested, so free energies are important for phase equilibria for example. Right, all your phase diagrams are drawn by taking Gibbs free energies. So, under given temperature, assuming pressure is a constant, for example, if you want to know what are the phases with composition and so on, those questions are answered by taking the free energies. Uh, and the classical approach, at least in materials, is to look at experimental data and collect this uh, free energy information and use that to construct your phase diagram. And that is the CALFAD approach, calculation of phase diagrams approach. But you can also do free energy evaluation using simulations and uh, if you can do that, uh, then you can get uh, uh, energies and, and hence phase equilibria, hence defect energies and so on. For example, all surface defects, you have a grain boundary, you have a stacking fault, you have a twin boundary, you can, the, the definition of the energy of these defects thermodynamically is basically the free energy associated with the defect. That is you take a system without the defect, evaluate its free energy and you take the same system, now introduce your defect, evaluate the free energy, take the difference between the two and attribute all the excess to this defect. Okay. So, interfacial energies are basically excess free energies associated with the interface. Okay. Why should it always be the excess? Why can't it be lower than? Right, I, I am telling you that okay, so this is a defect free system and this is with defect. So, I am saying that the interfacial energy, right, E interface is the free energy with. Uh, let me do it this way. And I am saying that this is, right, I am calling it excess, that excess free energy is the interfacial energy. Why is it excess? Why can't it be lower? Okay, but uh, why broken bond? I can have a twin boundary where no bond, uh, bond is broken. I can have a stacking fault.
Huh, but why should it always be greater? Different, okay, but why should it always be greater is the question. Now, if you truly look at the entropy arguments, no, except for point defect, I do not think, maybe in some cases dislocations. Uh, rest of them you will not see that they are equilibrium defects. Strictly speaking, they should not be preferred. So, let us assume that it is not excess, let us assume that it is negative, then what will happen? System will become unstable, it will undergo a phase transformation. Maybe the stacking fault energy in some system you measure as negative, that means the system would prefer HCP instead of being FCC, right? Which means the defect will form spontaneously in your system, which means the system will be full of defects, probably that full of defect state is something else, that is I mean not the reference that you are considering. So, if the system is stable, if you have a system and if it has a defect, that defect has excess energy, okay? You have to pay somehow to make that defect. If it is possible for it to reduce the system energy by forming, uh, the fluctuations we talked about this morning will form them and the system will find that, okay, this defect is favorable, so it will start collecting them. The system will typically undergo a phase transformation and reach the minimum energy state, where again another defect if it forms it will always have excess energy. So, interfacial energies, excess interfacial energies are the energies associated with defects. Uh, in simulation sometimes you will find uh, negative energies, which basically tell you that it is no longer stable and you will also see that in the simulation. The moment of forming them is favorable, it will form them all over the place and the system will undergo a transformation. Okay. Right. So, if it is a stable lower energy in stack, means uh, defect state in stacking fault three or twin C, then why when after handling or it forming stacking fault uh, why it's becoming stable? Do you agree that a single crystal should be the best state for any crystal? Yeah. I got rid of all grain boundaries. But do you see single crystals in real life? or how much effort you have to put to get single crystals. So, where do these grain boundaries come from? Why are they there in the first place? Right. So, uh, the, the, the process by which you form is really not a equilibrium process. I mean there are some nucleation happens and they come and they meet a boundary forms. Then it is a metastable state or sometimes uh, it, it is just a pinned. There is no kinetic pathway out of that defect for the system, right? Then it will just remain there. You can anneal it out, but even then, you know, the driving force for that goes down. So, you cannot really, with this also, you have seen experimentally, you can take some copper piece, put it, okay, it will grow to an extent. After that, there is no longer any growth, right? It gets arrested. You can also think of other ways. For example, if a hexagonal network structure forms, assuming everything is isotropic, etc., then six sided uh, uh, grains form, there is no way that that system can, you know, get rid of these boundaries. So, it is stuck in a metastable state, out of which pulling it out requires extra barrier. So, it could be kinetic, it could be because of the non equilibrium processing that happened. Whatever be the reason, like I said, I mean, except for vacancies, maybe occasionally some dislocation. If you look at the energy associated with the formation of defects and the entropy that it can gain, uh, none of them are classified. In fact, in textbooks, only point defects will be classified as equilibrium defects. That is, at any non zero temperature, you can show that so much of them should exist. The rest of them, they do not have to. I mean, we are stuck with it. At some level, you can think of engineering is all about that. I mean, these metastable structures are the ones that are favorable for us. And uh, so, we, it allows uh, for us to, you know, find ways of freezing them in and having them and so on. But in principle, no. 
This is true for interface boundaries also. If I have a precipitate, I would preferably have one single precipitate, assuming there is no elasticity, because if you have elasticity, then volume, it scales with volume energy, maybe large precipitate is not favored elastically speaking. But if you think only in terms of interfacial energy, then there should be one single precipitate. But we never reach, almost never reach, it, it's not possible to coarsen them out to a single precipitate except in simulations. So they are stuck in a state where they are either moving very slowly or they are kinetically arrested um, or their driving forces are so slow that they will not, uh, you know, for any foreseeable time will undergo this uh, change. Okay, any other question? Okay, so as is the theme with the course, uh, simulations are a good way to evaluate free energies because like I said, there are ways to get these free energies by looking at experiments, uh, but uh, there are always uncertainties and there are always problems and so on. So sometimes it is useful to look at the um, simulations to get these free energies. So that is why free energy evaluation becomes important for us. And just to recall, you have already seen this expression. The free energy is minus KBT log Z, where Z is the partition function or configurational sum, right? Okay. You can also, probably you also remember that the Partial derivative of free energy with respect to volume, keeping the uh, number of particles or molecules, atoms and uh, temperature constant is basically the pressure, right? If that is so, pressure should be easy to evaluate in a given system. So in the volume temperature plane, suppose you have a way to find a reversible path from a known state and a state of your interest. Then you can integrate along the path, you should be able to get the free energy and that is basically the idea behind the thermodynamic integration. The only catch here is that, okay, you might know for state 1 what is the pressure, state 2 what is the pressure, so right hand side is known, you do not have to worry, but when you integrate, the integration finally you are going to substitute these end points, which means at least for one reference point you should know the energy, otherwise you cannot calculate. Fortunately for us, there are states of known free energy analytically. Ideal gas is one and Einstein crystal is another, okay. So in this uh, lecture uh, and, and the implementation we are going to, we are dealing with a solid. So, we are going to use the Einstein crystal as the reference and Ferdi will at some point derive the expression for Einstein crystal that I am writing in a more general form. So, you will know where it, that comes from. Uh, this is also a condensed matter stat standard problem that some of you might have done. For others, Ferdi will show how it is done. But for now, I am going to assume in this lecture that uh, that expression is given or you know how to get it or uh, you accept that this is the expression from me. Okay. Now, in, in this, if suppose you are doing an experiment in the VT plane, you have a reference state for which you know the free energy, then you should have a physical path to reach the state in which you are interested in, right? That is how you will be able to measure the right hand side and then do this, you know the reference, you can calculate the difference and attribute it to free energy and so on. But if you are doing simulations, that is not needed. You can set up, if you, if you want a thought experiment, which takes you from some reference state to some other state of interest and one of the simplest things is what is known as Kirkwood's coupling parameter method, okay, where you take U1, which is the energy of reference state, Einstein crystal for us, U2 is the energy of system of interest, that is let us say a crystal with a stacking fault. Okay. Now, you introduce a linear coupling parameter lambda. How is it introduced? The energy U of lambda is written as lambda U2 plus 1 minus lambda U1. And you start changing lambda from 0 to 1. When lambda is 0, what do you get? 
lambda u2 is 0, 1 minus lambda is 1. So, you get u1 which is the reference state and slowly you start increasing lambda, you reach 1, what do you get? 1 minus lambda becomes 0, so u1 is 0, you get u2. So, you can always set up paths by introducing this arbitrary parameter lambda which goes from 0 to 1, which linearly interpolates between the free energies of these two states. Okay? And this is an idea that we are going to use in our thermodynamic integration today. I am going to show you that this is what we do. U1 is the Einstein state, U2 is the state of interest to us. So, we can go from here to there on the simulation. So, you do not have to worry, is there a physical way of reaching from this state to that state? Because we are doing it on the computer and that is the advantage of doing the simulations. right? Okay. So, at this point I have to tell you two things. One is most of it is there in Frankel and Schmidt. Please do take a look at I think chapter 10 is it? I do not remember the chapter number, something like that. So, there is a free energy evaluation chapter and they have lots of details and it is fairly comprehensive. So, take a look at Frankel and Schmidt. What I also liked and uh, uh, Sushil and uh, Kamlakshi, my other PhD student would vouch is that there is this wonderful paper by Fritas, Asta and De Koning. Uh, there are several, uh, uh, this is one and there is another one by uh, some Vega et al. Um, this is non-equilibrium free energy calculation of solids using lamps uh, published in computational material science. It is an editor's choice article and it is given with code snippets and there are two reasons why you should read this paper. One is if you are trying to do anything like this, it will save you about 6 months of effort. What you would do after 6 months, you will be able to do in a week if you carefully read this paper. Second thing is, these are the kind of papers we should aspire to write. Okay? Extremely well written and very clearly explained the formulation and then they get on to LAMPS implementation and they give all the details all the nuances, all the explanation and then they start adding code snippets and then they show that okay, if you are using Langevin in lamps, you have to say yes to this parameter or this uh, variable, otherwise you will face this problem or you even though formulation says that this is an NPT simulation, you cannot carry out this NPT simulation. So, you have to do an NVT simulation. Now, how do I do an NVT simulation for an NPT simulation? Okay. Lots and lots of such details, loads of such details and explained so nicely and so thoroughly. Okay. Vega et al also is another one, I think that is using the reversible scaling approach evaluating free energies for some ice water system. Again explained very neatly and there is a supplementary information and that supplementary information consists of the LAMPS code and you do not need anything else. That in file you take, all the other supplementary files they have given you take, you will be able to run. Once you have a working code which produces the result that the paper shows, then it is far more easier for you to do whatever you want to do with that code, modify for your purposes. Okay? So, I, I will also give reference to this Vega paper at some point, but for today's lecture you will see the entire lecture, the bottom line is Fritas et al, computational material science. So, I am strictly following this paper. Uh, please do take a look at this paper, read it, it is very nicely written and uh, like I said, I always aspire that we should write papers like this, right? It, it, it should be useful for people and should save lots of trouble for them so that they can take off from where you are living, not like only I can do and I can publish and everybody else again have to struggle for another two years to get to where I am. Uh, that is not the attitude which is very clearly seen from the way the, the paper is written. Okay. So, free energies from atomistic simulations, like I said there are equilibrium methods, there are non-equilibrium methods. In non-equilibrium methods, for example, adiabatic switching is a method in which calculations are performed explicitly along time dependent processes. If you do this non-equilibrium methods, how do we know, uh, how do we connect the free energy to what you are seeing in the simulation? For that, there is an important uh, theorem 
which is called Jarzinski's e equality. And that is the basis on which we make this connection that I take a non equilibrium path, I evaluate the free energy and somehow that is related to the equilibrium path or equilibrium free energy. Okay. So, what is the assurance that I can do that? That comes from this Jarzinski's inequality. Um, I think the reference is there in, in Freitas et al. Otherwise, also you can look up, uh, you, you will find. And, and I will show what it is at some level. I mean, I am not going to go into too much of details, but at least I will show you what it is. In the equilibrium method, what is called the thermodynamic integration, what we do is that we construct a sequence of equilibrium states between two thermodynamic states of interest, right. I know a reference state and this is the state that is of interest to us and I go from here to here in the VT plane for example. Then I take points along the path and to determine the free energy difference between the two states, we do the ensemble average of the relevant driving force for these two states. How do we do? We set up independent equilibrium simulations and numerically integrate. Once you have as the parameter how this uh, function is changing, you can numerically integrate and you will see that that is what we also do. But for doing this, the, the method is based on the thermodynamic equality between free energy difference between two states and the reversible work. Right? This is something that we had discussion, right. The, that uh, so free energy and the reversible work they are related okay that is why you have to be on the equilibrium path if you are not doing reversible work then there will be dissipation and that is not a state function right that becomes path dependent then so different paths you take you might get different so so you have to take a quasi static path that connects them and do this calculation, then you can connect the free energy differences to the work done, reversible work and hence you can evaluate the free energy difference. That is the idea behind the equilibrium methods. So, you are always at equilibrium at every point, you are moving from one state to the other state, you can calculate and you can get the values. What are the challenges in doing this thermodynamic integration? How do I discretize this quasi static path? Right? And at every point, I have to achieve equilibrium, right. First thing you have to do several simulations because you are taking several steps to go from one point to the other point. For each point, you have to do the equilibrium, which means equilibration will take time. After equilibration, you have to get the data, which means you have to do an ensemble average, which means that is also, I mean, you can do it as a time average, but you still need to run for longer time and take the average, right. So, giving sufficient time for equilibration and ensemble averaging, that is the main cost and you need to do that for several simulations, it is not one single simulation which you equilibrated and got the numbers and averaged and so on, that is not the case. So, thermodynamic integration generally is hard because it consumes lots of resources time and uh, computing power. In the non-equilibrium approach, we decide that okay, we will not do this equilibration, right. I will explicitly take a non-equilibrium path or I will deviate from my quasi-static path. But if I can do it in a controlled manner, I can still estimate somehow the dissipation or irreversible parts of this and then I can remove them or I can use them to do my calculation. So, that is basically the idea in non-equilibrium approach to free energy evaluation. Okay? Uh, so, we take an explicitly time dependent process and the rate at which this path is executed, right. See, there is only one equilibrium path. This goes back to that uh, famous thing about uh, Tolstoy's book. I do not know how many of you have read uh, Anna Karenina. So, the book is, book starts with a sentence, does anybody know? That all happy families are alike, 
but each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Okay. I first saw this quote in a partial differential equations textbook. It said that all ordinary differential equations are the same, but each partial differential equation is different in its own way. That is the same with equilibrium paths and non-equilibrium paths. You can take two states, there is one equilibrium path, but you can have so many non-equilibrium paths. right? So, how much non-equilibrium is that depends on what rate you are doing, because what is equilibration you have to give enough time. Depending on how much time you are giving or not giving, there could be several non-equilibrium paths. So, rate at which the path is executed tells you how much your path is deviating from your quasi-static path. Okay? So, you start from an equilibrium state and you end with another equilibrium state along an arbitrarily out of equilibrium process. Okay, I have not de defined what my non-equilibrium process is, some non-equilibrium process I achieved. Then Jarzinski's inequality connects the work done along the path and the free energy difference between the starting and ending processes. Okay. I took a non-equilibrium path, what is the work done along the path? How is it related to free energy difference between the two states? That is what Jarzinski's equality talks about. Okay. Unlike the quasi-static path, the work done in a non-equilibrium process is a stochastic variable, which means different realizations will give you different values and simulation is a way of sampling for that variation also. Okay. None of this is from me, okay. by the way, I am just uh, repeating whatever Fritas has explained. Okay. So, this is Jarzinski's e equality and it says this exponential minus beta del f, this beta is also a more common uh, notation for 1 by k b t, right. Uh, I think Ferdi called. Uh, I did not use it. <laughs> In your derivation, there was one place where. Uh, uh, finally mu or something you called and we finally realized that mu is 1 by k b t. Right? So, I, I do not remember, he used some notation. Oh no, this was the, the Lagrange parameter, in the, it was introduced as, as the Lagrange parameter. And then we realized that it is 1 by k b t later, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so, in this literature beta is also used to, to beta is typically 1 by k b t. So, 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 exponential minus beta del f is exponential minus beta w irreversible and the bar over tells that it is an ensemble average. Okay. Freddy used the triangular bracket that is also a common notation uh, comes from st statistics where uh, the, the triangular brackets are used bar is also used in statistics. So, both these uh, notations come from statistics, where averages are uh, either given by triangular brackets or by overline. So, del f is the free energy difference between the two end states. Started from one state, I ended up another state, del f is the difference, which is what is of interest to us. Jarzinski's equality says that if you take an arbitrary non-equilibrium path, work done along the path that is irreversible. That if you take exponential of minus beta that and average over ensemble, you will get this del f. This is very nice, equality is exact, it is not an approximation. Okay. But the practical application for free energy calculations is limited because if you want to exponential something and average, there could be large statistical uncertainties in their evaluation. So, it is a numerical thing. Some exponential thing you take and you try to average, you might end up with huge uncertainties. Uh, why you think? Why is it bad to average exponential quantities? Why would it? Uh, 
Anybody here has worked with uh, creep problems? So they typically give uh, uh, activation energy error bars which could be as bad as the energy itself. Right? <laughs> 200 plus or minus 200 kind of numbers you will see. Okay. <laughs> anyway, think about it. Why is it bad to, to average exponential? Okay, so, so we do not want exponential average, right? We want to avoid that. How do we go about doing this? Where I can avoid, so the, the inequality is great because it connects free energy difference to the irreversible work done along this non equilibrium path, arbitrary non equilibrium path. I mean, it is not any specified path. So, you can take any non equilibrium path, it tells you how to do. So, we want a little bit better than that. So, if you want to get the del f, which is only the reversible work, right? So, what should you do? What, what is the difference between the reversible work and the irreversible one? Dissipation. So, if you can remove from the irreversible one the dissipation, you will get the reversible. But remember, we are getting the W irreversible only as a ensemble average, not one number that I have, okay? Because that has a distribution. It is stochastic in nature. It is not just a number, okay? So, so, if you can from this ensemble average of irreversible work remove the dissipation somehow, then the remaining would be the reversible work which will be the del f because those two are only associated with the starting point end point. So, I, I can get that. Okay? So, the average dissipated heat generated for an ensemble of replicas of the non-equilibrium process that is the dissipation. By second law, we know that the dissipation is always greater than or equal to 0. When is that equal? For the equilibrium path. For any non-equilibrium path, arbitrary one, it is going to be anyway greater than 0. Okay? So, the equality is valid in the case of infinitely slow quasi-static process which is the thermodynamic integration part which is what and that is why there you do not have to we do not distinguish between reversible, irreversible, etcetera. You just do, you will get it in thermodynamic integration directly. That is not the case for us because there is dissipation. Um, this relation avoids exponential and only involves W irreversible, but important point to note is that W reversible and W irreversible is the ensemble average. Okay? So, So, the statistical uncertainties of doing this average on exponential are reduced, but we have now introduced an unknown quantity which is the dissipation. So, if we somehow can evaluate this, yes, of course, you can avoid averaging over exponentials. How do we calculate this dissipation uh, and how do we evaluate it? And we are trying to do something cleverer than that. You will see that we are trying to cancel out the heat dissipation somehow. Okay, so, that is so irreversible. There is always some dissipation. Somehow, you find a path where the dissipation will get cancelled out. So, that I will take the uh, rest as the reversible uh, work. So, that is the approach that we are trying to do. Uh, the way to do that removal of this dissipation, the energy associated with dissipation is to, if it is a systematic error, okay, that will be the same for two processes carried out in opposite directions. Okay. This is true only if the arbitrary non-equilibrium process that you are choosing is quite close to the quasi-static process. In other words, there are non-equilibrium paths that you can take in which if you go one direction and if you go opposite direction, the E dissipation exactly cancels out. Okay. Now, how close is sufficiently close? That is the region where the linear response theory is valid. Okay. Now, what is linear response theory? Right. 
Well, the name says linear response theory. So, I mean, do you know of any linear response uh, in, in material systems? Can you think of any linear response in material systems? F equal to k into x, okay, linear, fine. Then? Stress strain is linear, okay. Then? I mean, F equal to k into x is stress strain basically at some level. So. Electric field and voltage, concentration gradient and flux, right? Pretty much everything that you study, at least up to undergrad level, is all linear response only. You have a stimuli, you have a response, and that should be linear. The moment the linear response fails, you can get really interesting physics, right? Ohm's law fails, what do you get? If Ohm's law fails, what do you get? No, nobody has heard. Okay, if you fix law fails, what do you get? That should be easy to answer. Spinod, right? So, the moment you say it is no longer linear response, you can get uh, strange things. And uh, in, in, in the case of Ohm's law, what, what is it? Do you know? I mean, there are theories for this phenomenon which uh, assumes that, you know, it is no longer linear relationship between V and I, and uh, then you will get this. Uh, semiconductor or no, not semiconductor, the other way. Semiconductors still have a resistivity. That is the hint. Superconductors. So, there is some uh, Hitler London model, is it, or London theory of superconductivity, which is exactly the same like Kahn. It says, okay, no longer this linear uh, relation is valid and you can get. Uh, so, some of the phenomena like superconductors to explain, you cannot assume uh, the, the linear relationship between voltage and current. If you do, you will still end up with Ohm's law. There is a constant there. So, the, if linear response fails, you can get uh, really rich complex physics, but most of what we know is linear response. Linear response means if I change the stimuli a little bit, the response should be in proportion. It should not be out of proportion. Okay? So, that is what linear response is. So, when we say we should be close to the equilibrium path, my uh, my non-equilibrium path should be quite close to the quasi-static path. What we mean is that if the deviation is small, the deviation in other quantities should also be correspondingly small. I should not be taking a small deviation and end up somewhere else. Then that is that is not a good path to choose. Okay? That is what it means. So, for a linear response non-equilibrium process, connecting states 1 and 2, the E dissipation in one direction is exactly equal to the E dissipation in the other direction. So, which, which means if you choose such a path, such a non-equilibrium path, then if you calculate these irreversible work, the difference you take, that had a E dissipation, that had an E dissipation, they are equal, so they got cancelled. So, the difference now should be equal to the reversible, which should then be equal to the free energy difference. This is basically the idea behind the non-equilibrium methods of calculating free energies. So, you can calculate the magnitude of dissipation, of course. So, you add them and take the average. So, you will get the uh, dissipation. What is the advantage? I only need to take one path and it is not an equilibrium path. I am not worried about equilibration. Is it slow enough? And uh, am I making an average after it got equilibrated? How long did I average? None of that, right? One simulation, single shot, you, sh shot, you should be able to get, right? 
Now, what is important in this method is that, okay, I took a non-equilibrium path. Was it close enough to my quasi-static path that linear response was valid and this E dissipation I am thinking that got completely cancelled out? Did it get cancelled out? How do you evaluate? You take several of these non-equilibrium paths and see that you are actually converging when you are deviating from your equilibrium path. So, that will tell you whether you are okay with it or not. So, like Sushil will tell you, you have to do this uh, integration uh, by several times taking several different parameters and see how the results look like. Then you are at least uh, from, from the simulation point of view, you can convince yourself that you are doing it right. Okay? So, so if, if your linear response, you are, if you are in the linear response regime, right? what does linear response mean? That from the quasi-static path, whatever deviation I make, it makes only linear changes to the other quantity. In that regime, the dissipation will be equal if you go this way and if you trace back the same path. Okay? So, this is from the linear response theory. We are taking it that this is given. Okay, so, there are now some technical details which also I just want to go through because there are some clever things that are done using this. So, we are considering n particles which are confined to a volume V and the system is in contact with a heat reservoir at temperature T. What does that mean? We are dealing with an NVT ensemble. right? Now, we write the Hamiltonian. Okay? The Hamiltonian is a function of the point in phase space, r is my position which uh, Freddy called x uh, this morning, p is the momenta. So, they are vectors. So, if you are in three dimensions, you will have 3 n r and 3 n components of p uh, and if you are in two dimensions, you will have 4 n total degrees of freedom. So, it is a point in the phase space of the particles in the system and what is lambda? Remember that Kirkwood's method of introducing a lambda so that you can go from one free energy to the other. So, for this Hamiltonian, we are adding lambda. Okay? This is an auxiliary param parameter, some, some parameter that you add by hand. The purpose of this parameter is that, see Hamiltonian is what? It is the energy. So, u 1 lambda plus 1 minus lambda u 2 that is the lambda that we are introducing here and what is the partition function? Partition function is that integral that uh, or partition sum that Ferdi showed. It is the same integral and uh, we are having exponential minus beta h. So, it was shown as summation and this is the integral. So, okay. so beta is 1 by k b t that is uh, and h is the Planck's constant. So, okay. Now, let us consider del f. What is del f? That is what the free energy difference I want to calculate. So, it is the difference between free energy of the system which is in the final state which is my required state or state of interest minus some initial state which is the reference state. So, that free energy f n v t lambda i is somehow known to me. Okay? In fact, it is known to me analytically when I use Einstein crystal. Okay? So, I am going to skip this n v t for the rest of it. I am just going to use f unless there is a change. You can differentiate f with respect to lambda. Okay? That would mean taking that dou by dou lambda into this expression. f is minus k b t ln z and z is given. So, you can take and you can see that the dou by dou lambda will only act on the exponential. That is the only one that has the lambda in h. So, dou h by dou lambda will come out and you have also seen whichever quantity you want to get average. Right? This morning also we wrote. right? So, you can see this 1 by z integral d gamma by h to the power 3 and dou h by dou lambda exponential this is nothing but an average of dou h by dou lambda. 
do you agree right if this is the probability exponential this divided by z is the probability then you multiply that by this function then you will get the average of that function right so why is this called canonical ensemble average we are dealing with nvt ensemble right okay so you can see del f which is f of lambda f minus f of lambda i which is an integral from lambda i to lambda f d lambda this dou h by dou lambda you agree right the expression above shows dou, dou f by dou lambda is dou h by dou lambda canonical average lambda right so which means if i have to integrate then left hand side will give you f at lambda f minus f at lambda i and if i know f at lambda i that is the known reference state i only have to do this integration with the different lambda of this quantity do h by do lambda how is it changing with uh, so it's basically h versus lambda curve which is integrated and that will give me the reversible work which is nothing but the free energy change right okay in equilibrium approach the integral on the right hand side is done along the quasi static path that is the thermodynamic integration you discretize the integral on a grid of lambda values and execute equilibrium simulations for each lambda on the grid but in the non equilibrium we estimate the integral on lambda equal to lambda t path with lambda n lambda f switching over a time ts so we are saying that it is dt d lambda by dt do h by do lambda as a function of gamma t that is the phase space trajectory right what we are introducing here d lambda can be replaced by d lambda by dt dt right so that is all we are doing so this time is called switching time that is why i told you that what is the non equilibrium path it is a rate at which you do things which is what tells you how far you are deviating from the equilibrium path so that is why it is called switching time and this is the parameter that you need to determine by trial and error okay that determines basically the rate at which you do which then tells you how to calculate the free energy okay so of course in practice the integral is evaluated uh, by the um, whatever trapezoidal uh, rule basically so you have a md time step and you have total number of steps and you start from lambda equal to 0 and you keep adding a delta lambda to it and you reach the final state and you do it using different switching times and uh, you do several simulations and uh, and and those dissipation you try to account for and this systematic error is cancelled out when you take the difference and the most important point is to equilibrate for the given lambda before initiating the non equilibrium process we will see i'll also show you some uh, the the script as well as some points about uh, more details of the simulation when we okay so this is uh, i mean this is something that we have already discussed so you can write the kirkwood's method of uh, coupling parameters um and uh, it's it's basically the same so okay now one of the paths over which you can do integration non equilibrium integration to get the free energy is known as frankel lard path i am introducing this because i also want to introduce another method called reverse uh, scaling okay um and frankel lard is based on whatever we have discussed so far so you can see the formulation will be the same except that now we have put the actual hamiltonian that we are interested is what ferdi wrote this morning p squared by 2m plus u of r that is what we want to reach from where from an einstein crystal that is the um, hamiltonian for the einstein crystal not the not the exact one so ferdi will derive and he will show that uh, there is one more term there which i have not included called the zero point energy time or zero point vibration term that i have not included uh, but but ferdi will derive the einstein solid expression um and you can see what is it p squared by 2m is what 
kinetic energy. What is half m omega squared r i minus r i naught whole squared? It is vibrations, right? The, the potential energy part that is coming from the vibrations and what does Einstein crystal assume? And this is harmonic I agree, but is that all that is assumed or not rigid, no they are vibrating. So. There is also a Debye crystal, right? What is the difference between Einstein crystal and Debye crystal? Mm, that is the outcome, but what is the assumption? I mean, what is the assumption of the Einstein, for example, which Debye says, okay, no, we will modify. No, they are connected by spring, so there is a harmonic oscillation, but what he is telling is that each person or each atom, its oscillations are independent. It's not affected by this. There is one single frequency with which all of them are oscillating by themselves. There is no crosstalk. Okay. So that is why you are able to derive the analytical expression. Right? What is the ideal gas? Gas molecules do not talk to each other. What is the ideal solution? Atoms do not distinguish between bonds, right. So, similarly here they do not care about anybody else, they are by themselves and they are executing some vibrations, okay. That is the Einstein, um, the, the model and W is the oscillator frequency, right. That is the frequency with which they are vibrating and that is the equilibrium position. So, it is harmonic, you can say it is quiet in the potential. And so, for the Einstein solid, Ha, huh, what is Debye crystal? <laughs> what do you think is the Debye crystal? I thought by now all of you would say pairwise. <laughs> Okay. Uh, but, uh, I mean, you just put springs in between. The spring, uh, you all know Hooke's law, the, the force is proportional to the extension, which means the energy is proportional to the extension squared. Huh? Well, this is related, but no, no, it's not, not 100 percent the same. Uh, I mean, that's a consequence. I come to this, as I said, for a harmonic crystal, you don't have full on coupling in this point. Yeah? So, uh, but basically, it means that the, the vibrations are just in a parabolic uh, uh, potential. Yeah? <coughs> and this is still a situation one can deal with this paper and pen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In fact, in, in this, uh, Frankel and Smith explicitly make this point. Only two cases for which we know the analytical free energy expression so that they can be used as the reference state. For mostly for liquids, it is the ideal gas from which you start, and for solids, it is the Einstein crystal. And there are some small modifications here and there, some Einstein molecule approach or something like that, but they are all basically the same. Because this is the only case for which we can write the free energy. So, we have this uh, nice Kirkwood method. So, it does not matter as long as you have one Hamiltonian, another Hamiltonian connect through a lambda and take the lambda to 0 to 1. And in non equilibrium approach, that is taken through the switching time. So, take it from 0 to T s uh, 0 to 1 the lambda and do the calculation. Okay. So, So, if you know that, then you have the solution there. Which one? Uh, Einstein crystal, uh, the, the zero point energy. 
Yeah, yeah, I am not including because I am assuming classical there is no quantum. I mean in molecular dynamics if I put t equal to 0, nothing is going to vibrate, right? You saw, I mean we calculated the lattice parameter at t equal to 0. But that is strictly not true. So that is why Ferdi will derive an expression with the 0 point uh, oscillations included. But for our purposes, there is no 0 point vibration. Our particles are all classical. That is the assumption. We are doing classical MD, so there will be no vibration the at 0 Kelvin. Okay. Okay, is this clear? Any questions so far? No? Okay. Now there is a clever thing that one can do which involves a little bit of math. I am, I am skipping the details, uh, but at least the idea should become clearer to you. Um, the frankel lott path, this is the free energy expression. Einstein crystal plus whatever ensemble average go from I to F, F to I and take their difference divide by 2 and uh, add it to the Einstein crystal, you have got the free energy. No, classical does not mean H, H is a constant, right? No, 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 no. no. H is a constant, right? So, Nagarajan, we are assuming that the particle is classical, but the reference state for which you are taking energy, that still involves the H cut. You cannot take it arbitrarily, except that you know H cut, you know what frequency you are assuming. I am going to show you how to pick the frequency for the Einstein crystal, because you can make Einstein crystal with any frequency, right, arbitrarily. But there is a specific frequency we are going to choose. And you know the temperature and the n number of particles you know Kb is Boltzmann constant, T is the temperature, right? So this is just a number that you will calculate at the end of it. So you can't take H or H bar to be arbitrary, they are universal constants. Uh, I will show later, I think uh, the derivation of the Einstein Okay, the way to think about it is, can I calculate a de Broglie wa wavelength for myself? We can. Will you use a different H there? No. no. Right? So, just because some particle is classical does not mean that H value will change. That you have to calculate as is, right? But the, the relevant quantities that you calculate, etc., might become so small or negligible or is not really important and so on. So, so we will use the actual H only to calculate this quantity and add it for our system, right? Okay. And you can see if N is Avogadro number with Kb, that is going to give you R, okay? So 3RT and logarithm of some number, that is what the result is going to be, okay. Okay. So what is the idea behind the reversible scaling path? We consider the same Hamiltonian and for that we know what is the free energy because that is minus kbt ln z and you can put uh, ln z and uh, you, you, you see that the qt0 is basically that is coming from the potential energy and uh, you have an expression for free energy. The mathematical trick is to introduce a lambda which multiplies only the potential, right? And you call that as H of lambda, okay? And you calculate what is the uh, free energy for this uh, new system because it will then change the partition function that you calculated. Q will change because there is a lambda there. And you can show, this is where I was trying to do this derivation this morning, I could not get. Um, the F0 is 1 by lambda of F T0 lambda 
plus 3 by 2 n k b t 0 ln lambda by lambda. I still did not get to how they got the 2, uh, but the rest of it you can look at and they look very similar and so on. <laughs> if, if they just asked me, I would have said 1 by lambda f t 0 plus 3 n k b t 0 ln lambda, that is what I would have expected, but this is not a typo or anything. I checked this is there uh, from 99 or something they have derived. In any case, what you can do is that the last expression 24, the first term on the right hand side F0 T0, that is from the Frankel lad. If you know that, then you can do simulations by changing lambda and evaluate whatever is there on the last term and that will give you the free energy at, as a function of temperature. So, this reversible scaling is a trick for calculating free energies as a function of temperature. Okay. What it is basically doing is to take the Hamiltonian and somehow scale the potential energy of the Hamiltonian with a scaling function and with some math tricks you can show that the expressions are identical to what we have been looking for in the frankel lard path and using frankel lard you know at some constant see you always need a reference for frankel lard the reference is einstein crystal for this now you can take from frankel lard what you got as for a particular temperature as the reference from there you can build for any temperature so that is basically the idea so, reversible scaling is important because most of the times our interest is in getting free energy as a function of temperature, right. We, we, we saw that okay, free energy as a function of temperature for solid liquid, then I will know where the melting temperature is and so on. So, the phase equilibria can be obtained if I know how it is as a function of temperature, okay. Okay, so I think I will stop the formulation part, uh, I know that it is a bit intense, but please do go back and read the Fritas paper and uh, some of you at least who have the StatMec background might also be able to follow up on some of the other things. But for the others, there is a way to calculate free energy and there is some justification for doing it from the uh, statistical mechanics and it is easier to do it through a non-equilibrium path. And there is a control that you can have on that non-equilibrium path to convince yourself that your calculations are right. So, this much is uh, uh, given. So, the reason why we got interested is to calculate stacking fault energy at non-zero temperatures. In fact, we wanted it as a function of also composition because in copper aluminum system with the increasing amounts of aluminum, the stacking fault energy drops from 40 millijoules per meter squared to about almost 0 by about 12, 13 atomic percent. That is why there is a phase transformation. There is a two phase region that comes up with a HCP structure at lower temperatures. That is because now the stacking fault energy has become negative, which is almost a phase transformation guaranteed for you. Instead of being FCC, the system would prefer to be HCP and rich in aluminum. And that is also seen even in cases where it has not phase separated, but if you have a stacking fault, aluminum atoms prefer to go sit next to the stacking fault because they somehow prefer the HCP arrangement when, when you have copper and aluminum. Okay. So, we were interested in calculating stacking fault energy as a function of composition and temperature and so we thought that thermodynamic integration will be a right way to go and that is how I learnt all of it. I mean Kamalakshi did the thermodynamic integration, now Sushil is doing and I learnt along the way because they were trying to figure out all these things. Yeah, we, we, we can. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah, I, I just wanted to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can do tomorrow also. It's not a problem. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can do tomorrow. I just want to leave you with one question though. If my stacking fault energy is, like I said, let us say pure copper, I want to calculate stacking fault energy, that is 40 millijoules per meter squared. Okay. Now, I have a simulation cell where the stacking fault area will be angstrom squared, nanometer squared. Okay. 
how accurate should my free energy evaluation be so that I can get meaningful stack stacking fault energy? Okay. It's something for you to think about. I mean, th that is why uh, some of these free energy evaluations, I mean, more recently only people are able to do because the accuracy also becomes a huge issue. Accuracy obviously means larger system sizes and uh, better calculation, more calculation and so on. And if you take the equilibrium approach, uh, sometimes it is uh, very, very costly. I mean, it is not really feasible for most people to do. Okay. So, so I will stop here and… Uh, that was this question about the Einstein crystal. How can we calculate… Uh, partition function and perhaps to resume what it is. We imagine a crystal and each atom can vibrate, say like this or whatever vibration mode it has is the vibration frequency omega. And yeah, this was this little discussion before. Uh, what are the energies of vibration? And this I just give here without explanation. Uh, in quantum mechanics, the, yeah, all the energies are quantized. Uh, so, and, and you cannot have arbitrary amounts of energy put into the system. So the vibration energy of an atom in vibration state I is just given by a formula I plus one half. This is elementary frequency. We call it the Einstein frequency. Yeah. This one half, this is uh, what we call the zero point energy or the zero point vi vibration. Even if you go to absolute zero, uh, still the atoms would vibrate. And the reason again is uh, uncertainty relation. If it would not vibra vibrate, uh, this would mean uh, the momentum is zero and the um, positional uh, uncertainty is zero and that's not possible. So that's why we have this uh, ground state energy here. And then we can now uh, calculate this partition function or as I called it, the configurational sum. I, I like this second term more because it says what it is. Yeah? It is just a sum over all configurations. Yeah? And here it just means we have to sum over all these energy states. for these energies here. And in principle, it does not matter whether we, whether we take one atom or n atoms uh, because they all contribute the same. Yeah? <coughs> and uh, yeah, we can take out this first, uh, the second factor, this one half omega e. So this results, oh, I for, forgot the most important one, that's the h bar here. h bar is Planck's constant over 2 pi, uh, and what it is, 1.0 something, 10 to minus 34 uh, joule seconds. <coughs> so we have the uh, the second part here, which is the same for all oscillators or for all uh, excitations here, over 2 kT. And the rest, I hope you know. I put a J here instead of an I, otherwise you would confuse it with the imaginary unit, yeah? So, or perhaps you would. So 
this infinite sum, does anybody see how to solve it? I can rewrite it a bit, then I'm sure you see. J. So it's a number, power zero, power one, power two, and so on. So it's uh, and then you, you you know what the sum of the result of the summation is. Mm -hmm. Geometrical series. This is the partition function here. And as I said, it's pretty short. But we can do a bit more to make it not too short. We can calculate the logarithm. And why did I take the logarithm? Because this is nearly the free energy for n atoms, 3n. Three times, uh, three, uh, and then this, because it has three vibration modes, three direc directions. Uh, um, perhaps I should first write what the free energy is. This would be for one Einstein uh, oscillator and then for n oscillators with three directions, we have three n kt. So if we do this, we get, okay, and the minus sign is missing here. Uh, we get 3 over 2 in h bar omega e plus 3 in kt and then this logarithm. Got the exponential here. And the minus, <laughs> I should uh, perhaps rewrite it. Can you still read it? Probably not. One minus exponential minus. Now it's correct. Okay, so this is the free energy of the Einstein crystal, and that's the starting point of the thermodynamic integration. And we can 
I, I just thought about it. I mean, this first thing here is this quantum mechanical contribution, this zero point energy. And this uh, other part here is a, a finite temperature contribution. And I try to put them against each other. Uh, so if you have a not too low temperature, <coughs> I mean, the Einstein frequency should be some typical frequency of the crystal, so it should be something like 10 to 12, 10 to 13 hertz. Uh, then probably uh, if the temperature is large enough, this uh, h-bar is small, this means that this term is small. We can, we can expand it in a Taylor series. So we can simplify this into so one minus and if we expand the Taylor series that's one minus the argument so this is one uh, plus and these ones cancels out, cancel out. So we keep something like this here. Now we can try to estimate just uh, I don't know whether this, is, this exists with a thick sum we, we used to say in Germany if you just measure it, uh, not very precisely. Uh, if we say the, uh, the Einstein frequency <coughs> is in the order of uh, yeah, 10 to 12 hertz or so, uh, h bar is 10 to minus 34, uh, so we are somewhere, this is an energy, h bar times the frequency, uh, we are at I don't know, pico electron volts or so. So at very low energies here. What's this term here? I said we can only say something is small if we have something to compare. Kt uh, at you know, room temperature is uh, 40s of an electron volt, you know, 25 milli electron volts. So it's say 0.1 electron volt. Yeah. What, what can we say about this factor here? It's probably not very large, but due to the log logarithm, it's also not a, not a huge factor. Yeah? So here we have something in the range of tens of electron volts. Here we have something in, in the range of, I don't know, I, di I did not calculate it, but uh, you know, I, I, I can try, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, I don't want to say stupid things, but I would suppose that this is much smaller than this term here. That's why in, in daily life, so to say, in normal uh, temperature mo uh, molecular dynamics, we can neglect these zero point contributions and just carry this one here. I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, the Phonon energies are also milli-electron volts, so it's not completely negligible, uh, but still it's a small contribution, I would say. Yeah. So this was this, this little point about the Einstein model here, which I think is easy to understand. And tomorrow I think we continue then with, with real phonon spectra and so on. Uh, and I wanted to add another point, which I forgot, and perhaps I can briefly put this here, about fluctuations. Uh, and again, it nicely fits to what Guru just said. Uh, he spoke about this linear response theory or, or so. And, and that's, I mean, what we normally assume, not only in physics, but also 
uh, in daily life. Yeah? I mean, uh, everybody thinks if today's weather is fine, tomorrow it will be fine as well, yeah? or maybe a bit different, not completely different. Yeah? Or if you put this pen uh, a little bit, it moves a little bit. Yeah? But sometimes if I move it a bit further, then it falls down. Yeah? So this is uh, until <laughs> it's linear response. And then sometimes catastrophes happen, like perhaps someday in climate or so, yeah, which is not a harmonic si or not a linear system. Uh, and in these linear response systems, so I put it here onto the same slides. You have this nice relation. I, I don't want to go into the details. I just wanted to. Uh, to give the results here, that fluctuations and uh, susceptibi susceptibilities are somehow related. What are susceptibilities? That are these, these uh, response functions. Yeah? Uh, so for example, the, the elastic constants, they give the, the relation between applied stress and the resulting strain or vice versa. Yeah? or specific heat uh, gives a relation uh, between the, the input energy and the temperature change, yeah? and so on. So these are the, the response functions, and they are uh, related to amplitude of fluctuations functions. I think I, I, I derived one, one fluctuation uh, of the momentum, or what was it? Uh, but what you can easily do in a mo molecular dynamic simulation is that you measure these fluctuations. For example, if you are in constant pressure, the volume will fluctuate. Yeah? So you just measure or you, you uh, register the volume for each time step, and then you get the fluctuations. And one of these uh, equations is that the uh, uh, variance of the, of the volume change is given by this relation here. Uh, of course, the fluctuations get stronger if the temperature gets, high, gets higher. This is, I think, plausible. This dvdp uh, has a simple meaning. I think I introduced it some time ago. Is ah, the compressibility or one over the bulk modulus. Oh, let's write it as a C, I guess. Yeah. So if you revert this, this is kT. The minus sign cancels out with the other minus sign. V times the compressibility. So by measuring the volume fluctuation, you can determine the compressibili compressibility of the system. Yeah? without applying a stress or so, yeah, or, or pressure. Yeah. So this can be very helpful if the fluctuations are the correct ones. Yeah. Uh, and there exist many other relations like this. So one further is temperature fluctuations.
They are given or related to the specific heat at constant volume. These are useful if you work at uh, constant volume instead of constant pressure. So pressure fluctuations, but they give a pretty similar oops, DPDV. Pretty similar relations, this is just one over the compressibility then. So also from the pressure fluctuations, you could derive the compressibility. And uh, I, I don't, did not write down <laughs> all these relations. From length fluctuations, you would get the uh, elastic modulus in one direction, and so on. So you can, in principle, you can derive all the elastic constants just from the fluctuations if they are proper, uh, or if your barostate thermostate is properly behaving. That's how I learned these things. I, I once tried to apply, I forgot for, for which one, uh, probably for the compressibility, uh, this, this trick, and I measured the fluctuations, and, and then I did it uh, with a, by hand, so to say, yeah, by just applying a pressure, and the results were completely different. And what I did was before to apply such a barrow state which just rescales the volume. And of course, this cannot give the correct results yeah, because the fluctuations are not correctly chosen. This was just an addition to what we said before, what I explained it before. Okay, I think this is all I, I would explain today. Uh, in principle, I had planned to say much more about lattice vibrations, but I think this will be postponed to, to tomorrow. Yeah. And here yeah, um, I think this is a bit lengthy. Uh, I, 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 I would do it tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, that's another way, or it's quite similar to what Guru explained. Another way uh, to evaluate this uh, integration of. Uh, the system along such a strange path where you switch from an Einstein crystal or whatever system to another realistic system. There is a method called a method of overlapping distributions, uh, which also gives you a way to evaluate free energies. Yeah. But I think this, yeah, this is more than half a page. It's more like two pages or so. so I think uh, before everybody gets too tired. We should better stop here, oh, except if you are eager to learn more. Nobody dares to say. <laughs> okay, then we stop here.